Lord, I thank you so much for tonight, for the opportunity for us to look together into your word, into um, a bit of a mystery and a passage that's disputed, a passage that um, kind of asks, causes us to ask questions and scratch our heads and say, wow, that must have been pretty wild. Um, I pray that we would be able to hopefully establish some clarity, some understanding, and that um, it would cause us to reflect on what you did in the past that involves what's going on now and what will happen in the future so that we can be in greater awe of you. And that's our ultimate goal, to love you and be more and more in awe of you all the time. Thank you for the words of Solomon who said that the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Teach us, each one of us, to do that very thing, to fear you. That you would know that we truly, um, even in part, understand a little bit about who you are and what you're like. So thank you for all this and how you'll answer prayer and go above and beyond, because that's what you constantly do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, we have a fun subject tonight. You know that I love the Hebrew Bible and I, I love the history of Israel, and even before the history of Israel. Um, so I want us to look at a passage tonight together. It's in Genesis chapter 6. If you have a Bible with you, you're welcome to turn there. It's going to be the beginning of the chapter, the first seven verses primarily. Um, we kind of quickly need to set the context, though. What's going on as we jump into Genesis chapter 6, the beginning of the chapter? Um, if, you, if you remember... Um, as I like to tell my students when, when I teach this class on Genesis 1 through 11, it, it's, it's a third-year Hebrew class, so Hebrew students in third-year Hebrew, I, I teach that class. Um, and I tell them that this is a world that was spinning out of control. We can't appreciate this well enough. The, the world was a deadly place. Uh, if you don't believe me, look at um, what happens after the flood, and of course the flood is the moment when God kind of puts down the hammer. He's had enough of the crazy wickedness that's going on in the world. Uh, and not only human wickedness, but wickedness from the entire uh, animal world. Um, but if you look after the flood at that text where you have the, uh, not only the covenant that God establishes with Noah and his promise that he'll never again bring destruction to the world by water, but there is that section on the first law. It's the first ever law recorded in the Bible, and it's universal. It's not strictly for the Israelites. It's for all people. It's established with Noah, who, by the way, of course, is apart from his family, all alone on planet Earth. So when God gives that law to Noah, it's to be applied universally to all people who come forth from Noah and his, um, his daughter-in-laws, if you will. So um, in, that, in that section, um, God says, well, and, and, and the heartbeat of this first law is, we call it capital punishment. If someone, and this is paraphrasing, of course, if someone takes the life of a person, what are you to do? Anyone? Take the life of that life taker. That's what God establishes. Now, why, pray tell, would God institute such a law like that? <laughs> Necessity. Looking back in retrospect. The world was out of control. Um, the first brothers, how do they treat each other? Love and harmony and hugs and kisses? No. Murder. So we go from Adam and Eve and their first sin is a little white lie. Yeah, it's, it's still a lie. It's still wrong. But we go from that to the next generation, murder. I mean, you'd expect it to take like six or eight generations, right? It doesn't take that. That's the human heart. It's out of control. Why? Because there is no law. And mankind left to himself will destroy himself, the world around him, and of course, in many ways, even more so destroy that relationship 
that he, that we have with God. So that's part of it. Uh, so that law is for people because there were people killing one another. You have the example of Cain and you have the, um, you know, Cain and Abel, and you have the example of Lamech. So you have multiple examples of murder that are documented by Moses, who, by the way, is writing long after the flood. So it's not like he was around in the pre-flood world to watch all of this happen. He just documented two murders. But folks, probably that was the tip of the iceberg. And what else was, was connected to that law? Not only if a person kills a person, but if what else kills a person? An animal. You're to take the life of that animal. And hopefully we practice that today. We kind of stop practicing it with humans who kill, but we usually practice it with animals, right? In most places in our country, if an animal, a bear or whatever, kills a person, what happens? A bunch of people go hunt that animal down and take it out so that it won't kill another person. Why? Because once you kill, you have the propensity to continue to kill. That's the problem. It becomes all the easier the second time around and the third time easier than the second. So there's reason for this. So, you know, the text that we're going to jump into, we have to understand that this was a world that was just spinning, spiraling down, getting worse and worse and more decrepit. And God had to blow the whistle and stop play. But there was a moment in all of this where I guess you could say, to put it colloquially, um, a straw that broke the camel's back. One moment where this set of events that's recorded there uh, kind of puts a capstone to it all. And, and that's when God says, enough is enough, and now is the time to move against mankind and the world because of this, this uncontrolled wickedness that's going on in this world that, that God created. So that's the context, right? So don't lose sight of that. There's a reason for, for, um, for what goes on in our seven verses that we're going to look at, and that's what it's all about. Um, it's, it's that final moment when mankind... Uh, takes one step too far, or even more than mankind. Some culprit is involved in this who, who makes God so angry that he can't wait anymore. He's going to uh, start over. Erase mankind, save one family, and then begin afresh. A second Adam, if you will, in that sense. So, that's our context. So, I've titled this, and I, you know, I struggle with you know, what's the best way to title this, and maybe I don't even have it yet, but this is my new title, The Diabolical Scheme of Evil Angels in Noah's Lifetime. The Diabolical Scheme of Evil Angels in, Moses's, I'm sorry, in Noah's Lifetime. So I'm already showing you my hand, I guess. I'm you know, going to the end of the book and reading at least a little bit there. So you see my view right away. Um, but this is an issue because not everybody is on board with this. Uh, I, if I can be fully open and honest with you, I don't like this. I don't like the view that I hold. I don't like the view. I don't like what I'm convinced happened. I would rather do it a different way, okay? There are different things. There are several things, you know, in, in, in the Bible that if I could be in charge, I would change them. But guess what? I am not in charge, and I won't be. But that's okay, because God can be trusted better. So, um, but because there's a dispute, we, we really need to kind of dig down to understand it. And so my, my hope is that I can give you confidence in, in this view, that it's, it's the right view, um, and that it will help you see What's going on throughout Scripture um, afterward that's connected to this, and it will make sense. And so we'll look at that um, toward the end. If we have time, we'll get to a connection, I believe, can uh, be made, th that can be made. Um, 
Oops, now all of a sudden it doesn't want to advance. Let's see. Uh oh. There we go. Okay, now it's advancing. Um, and that is, for me as an archaeologist, I want to know, you know, if these kinds of individuals were on earth at this time and they lived and then those who were still alive at the time of the flood, they all died in the flood, then can we find them in the archaeological record? I'm inquisitive. I want to know. So uh, I ended up stumbling into what I'm convinced is a great option archaeologically for who these individuals are. So if we have time, we'll get there. And maybe I'll need your permission at some point to, to continue. So, you know, you can flip the coin for me. All right. Um, so what about a date of the event and the identification of the problem? So we start with, um, and this is just a little bit of a list. You can take a picture of it if you want to kind of look at it as we go or in your own time. But um, the date, I just want to give you the date I'm holding at the moment, uh, 3298 B.C. for the, the time of the flood. Um, and then the next event on the calendar or on the timeline is the, uh, the dispersion at the Tower of Babel in about 26... Uh, 25 or so. Um, that date is, is um, tentative. I'm not very, um, not very confident about uh, the precision of that number, but I think it's fairly close, okay, for that one. And then um, we go on. I'll just mention the third one. In, in about 2320, we have the reign of Sargon beginning. Sargon is the king of the Akkadian Empire, what becomes the Akkadian Empire, the world's first empire. And I try to um, connect him with, um, with Nimrod in Genesis 10. The Bible's Nimrod, I'm saying, is equal to Sargon of Akkad, the first empire builder in history. Um, and I'm actually trying to finish writing a book, and hopefully soon enough it will be out, but I'm trying to finish a book that, that makes that argument that he is that guy. Um, and for whatever reason, people are fascinated with the story of Nimrod. Um, I know that for sure. So, um, but the only number that really connects with us is 3298, the universal flood. So we're going to a time before 3298 BC. That's a long time ago. So that's, um, you know, that's like 50, um, you know, right, right around 5300 BC. Uh, I'm sorry, right around 5,300 years ago, a long time, over five millennia ago, um, at the time when there was chaos on the earth. Um, if you want to look at more sources to look into this, as far as establishing 3298 as a date with confidence, there's, there are three or four. The fourth one actually is a source that I will be hopefully coming out with, uh, a book on Biblical History of the Third Millennium B.C. So the first is an article by um, Jeremy Sexton and Henry Smith. Second one is a follow-up article, if you will, uh, that Henry Smith does. Um, and that, especially that second one, is where, where you'll see him um, land on that number. Then Roger Young um, writes an article that, that attempts to um, fix a problem, which is Bishop Usher's chronology really isn't that precise. And so he draws out the flaws in it because many people, especially, especially uh, those of us who are over 50, um, we may have been you know, exposed to this and um, been, I don't know, led into uh, kind of supporting that chronological system he presents, but Roger Young demonstrates why it's flawed. And then hopefully my book will, will um, work toward uh, further resolving this problem or further solidifying um, a different view than is normally held. All right, so here are the questions for us tonight, um, if we can get to all of them. Who are the pre-flood evildoers of Genesis 6? And that, and that we have to, we, we will have time for that for sure. What were they attempting to accomplish here? I think we'll have time for that one too. What are their physical remains? That's the one time we'll have to be on our side. And then, were they actually giants? Does anyone, does that ring a bell with anyone? Okay. Were they giants? That one we'll have time for too. So, 
Those are some of the questions we're going to tackle. What are the two major views? There are other views out there, and I understand that, and I, I don't want to step on toes. You know, if, if you or someone you know has a view that's different than these two, um, I'm sorry for not giving it airtime. But yes, there are other views. I just want to focus on the two major ones because they're most commonly held. So uh, what's the problem? There is a fervent disagreement that's arisen among interpreters over the meaning of not just this, but especially this, the sons of God in Genesis 6-4. Who are the sons of God? What are the two major views? The first, and the term in Hebrew for sons of God is bene, that's sons of, ha, the, Elohim, God. Sons of the God, literally. But the reference is to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, uh, the Bene Ha Elohim, or sons of God, of Genesis 6-4, are evil angelic beings who were permitted to take on human flesh and live among human beings who descended from the line of Adam. Right? So they're evil angelic beings who were permitted by God. God gave them permission to take on human flesh so that they could serve some purpose in God's overall plan. And you can see already that view is not attractive, is it? There aren't people that are just going to be rushing to take this view because it's so cool of a view. It's like, well, we'll take it if we have to and there's no other option, right? And that's, I think, part of the reason for the rise of other views, such as number two, the B'nai Ha Elohim of Genesis 6-4 are human beings from the godly line of Seth. And I put godly line in quotes. Yeah, the son of Adam who was born to Eve after the death of Abel, whom Cain murdered, right? So according to this view, there are two lines. There is a, an evil line, uh, and that line connects to Cain, and there is a godly line, and that line connects to um, Seth. Um, and of course, problem number one with this view is, yeah, it's... It should crack a smile. The Bible never speaks of a godly line of Seth. That's problem number one. So if you're going to hold a view, you'd at least like it to be spoken about in the Bible. But this one isn't. So that's right away a hurdle that needs to be overcome for view two, which is, again, a much more attractive view. I admit it's, it's more attractive. You don't have to assert that this strange thing would happen where God gives angelic beings evil, evil angelic beings of all things, the permission to take on human flesh and to, and let's keep this PG, cohabitate with women, right? Would God do that? Seems strange, doesn't it? All right, let's look at the issues that are involved. So there are um, four sources that I can point you to. Uh, right away, there's a book that came out just in 2019. I reviewed it. I, I did a review on it, and my review is online on my academy.edu webpage um, of this book called The Sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Um, I did everything I could to like this book, but it's really tough. Um, there, there are lots of flaws. There, there's, there's really good research on the history of the views. Okay, There's really good research on that. But as far as getting right the problem, it swings and misses. Kind of like three times, I guess. You know, third strike and you're out, in my opinion. Um, second uh, um, source, if you would like, and now we're talking videos, right? So it makes it easy. Uh, you can go online and you just Google Michael Heiser. You maybe go to YouTube or whatever. Michael Heiser, The Unseen Realm. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, there, there is a book that he wrote, so you could get the book and read it, or you could go on to YouTube and uh, Google his name and, and maybe Evil Angels or something like that, and you'd, it would certainly come up and you could watch that video. That's worth watching. Um, his is shorter, if memory serves, and Peter Gentry's, that's number three, is longer, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, Peter Gentry is a wonderful scholar, um, really brilliant man. Uh, he's probably one of the world's most renowned authorities on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. 
um, and, and he's, he's a dear friend. I've met with him a, a number of times in Toronto and uh, hope to maybe work with him in the future if, if the opportunity would ever arise. So there's his video, and then um, there's something uploaded to myacademia.edu webpage called Identifying the Sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 through 7. It's a short paper. It's not long. It's not intended to be long, but it's a, it's a tool to kind of help you sort through the issues. So there are those resources if you'd like to look into it further. Um, now let's um, kind of formulate a little bit of an outline of our text, our passage, Genesis 6, 1 through 7, and then look at my translation. And you're getting 100% my translation um, for good, bad, or indifferent, your choice. All right, the outline. The first section is chapters... Uh, I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6, which is the actors and their actions. Who is involved? Who are the players on the stage, right? Um, Reminds me of my wife's line, which is, get off the stage, love. You're killing the play. She's a theater grad, so I have to give her a little plug. Uh, So the actors and their actions as they're on stage. Verse 3 is the consequences of their actions for mankind. So that's the first two parts of the story are, um, are actually kind of narrative action, narrative uh, text that's, that's giving us blow by blow. And then with verse 4, and we'll talk about this as we look at the passage, uh, it goes a little different direction. But anyway, verses 4 through 7 is an elaboration of their actions and the judgment that's pronounced. And of course, the judgment is on God's part. He's the one who pronounces judgment against um, the actors in all of this. Okay, so that's the outline. Now let me walk through the text with you. It says this, beginning of verse 1, Now it came to pass that the man, and when you see brackets, I'm adding a little parenthetical thought for you or a little um, footnote to kind of help you see where I'm going with the text. It's called an interpretive translation. Now it came to pass that the man, that is the race of mankind, began to increase on the surface of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Then the sons of God, that's what we're getting at, right? Who in the world are these sons of God? The B'nai Ha Elohim. Uh, then the sons of God saw or looked at the daughters of literally the man, But I'm suggesting to you the idea there is, that is, the race of mankind. Not one particular man, but mankind as a whole. That they were beautiful. And that's part of the reason for the justification to make it um, plural, make the man plural. Because here we have a shift to a plural pronoun. That they were beautiful. I'm sorry, that's actually with the daughters. That they, the daughters, were beautiful. So they, that's... That's the race of mankind. That's the plural of the man. So they, these sons of God, took women for themselves from all whom they had chosen. And by the way, there's nothing at all in the text here that suggests that this was marriage. Okay? Nothing whatsoever. So if you think marriage is involved, you think there's, you know, this is a good union of people, that everybody's on the same page. That's not what the text is saying. So don't miss that. Verse 3, so he who is said, right? Now God's going to evaluate. So he who is said, my spirit will not contend with the man, that is the race of mankind, again, forever, of whom indeed he is flesh. Mankind is only flesh. He's not like I am, essentially, is what God's saying here. He's not like I am. He's just flesh. And the implication that God doesn't say here is he's prone to wickedness. Mankind is prone to wickedness. And remember, this is only our last straw we're looking at. We're not looking carefully at all the other things that mankind has done. We alluded to that a little bit, the murders and so forth. But there's a lot of bad news for mankind. So it's not just the sons of God who are involved in evil here, but the acts that they commit kind of bring it all together. Um, Thus, his days will be 120 years. Now, at this point, and I put a parenthesis there for the reason 
that what's coming next is not more sequential actions in the narrative, but it's a parenthetical statement. Um, you, using the, the stage analogy again. Uh, it's as if one of the actors, and this happens in certain plays, by the way, especially the older ones, um, while the play's going on, the action will stop, and one of the actors will maybe come forth a little bit, maybe there'll be a special spotlight shown on that person, everyone's darkened or whatever, and that person will talk. And that's called a soliloquy in a play, right? But essentially, it's a parenthetical portion where you're getting ex you as the audience are getting extra information that the writer of the play deems that you need that to be able to understand what's going to happen, right? Or what did just happen, either way. So that's the idea here, okay? So Moses is, spotlights on him, soliloquy, he's giving extra information here. So here we go. The fallen ones, and in your Bibles you probably have the word Nephilim, and of course, as you may know by now, that kind of makes a little bit of light smoke come out of my ears from being unhappy that the translators don't translate, but instead they transliterate, just giving you the Hebrew word. The translation, folks, is the fallen ones. It's a masculine plural participle. The fallen ones, and in the King James, if you want to go there, is the word giants. Um, were on the earth in those days. And afterwards also when the sons of God were going into the daughters of the man. And sired, and I'm writing in there the word offspring. And I, you see it in italics. That's why, because it's, it's being added. It's not in the text. And literally it's and sired to them. So the, get this, this is important to, to understanding this correctly. The offspring are never once mentioned. Never. Never once. I'm just adding that word in there, and maybe your translation adds it in there. Whether it's italicized or not, it's not in the Hebrew. Okay? So that's important because a lot of times interpreters take the subsequent individuals mentioned that we're going to get to now, or actually the second one we already, we already covered, the fallen ones. Who are the fallen ones? Are these the offspring? The offspring are never mentioned. The point is, the fallen ones are one and the same as the sons of God. That's the point. It's two sides of, a of the same coin, right? You pull a nickel out of your pocket. It doesn't look the same on either side, does it? But it's the same coin. So that's what's going on here. It's a, it's a different way of looking at these individuals. That's all it is. So, um, and sired offspring to them. They, that is the sons of God, which is equal to the fallen ones, were, and my translation I believe is a little less um, confusing or potentially misleading, un unintentionally potentially misleading, were the powerful ones. Literally in Hebrew, it's giborim, but not mighty men. Mighty men is not the best translation there because it implies something good, and I'm going to try to convince you that they weren't good. Who were from, etern uh, or who were from antiquity. It doesn't really say eternity. Who were from antiquity, from much, much older times. That's the point. Not eternity. Um, and then this word, males of renown. And note this, it could use the word men. Um, it, it could use a word that's, that's always used of the descendants of Adam, right? There's a Hebrew word for that. It doesn't use that word. It uses the word males of renown. Um, I'm pretty sure it's been so long since I looked. I can't remember if this is 100%, but if memory serves, when we have things going on earlier in creation with the animals, I think the word males was used there, but certainly it's used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible where we're talking about a certain animal and it bears a, a male offspring, right? And you can use that word, male. 
but you can't use the word man there, or he, which, which really is universally to be understood as a human being, not just, not just a male person, but a human being, male or female. That word's not used here. Male is used. That should tip you off a little bit that we're not talking about somebody who's derived from mankind. And that's really important. That is often overlooked. Now, he who is saw that great was the wickedness of mankind on the earth. There you go. If you didn't believe me before that this place is spiraling out of control, then believe the words of God right there. The wickedness of mankind on the earth is great. And every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the day long. So he who is was grieved, and it's not repentant, folks. If you have a translation that says repentant, um, I'm disappointed. He who is was grieved. The idea is grieved to his heart, if you will. Um, that he had made the man, that is the race of mankind, on the earth. And, he heard, and that, by the way, is our word that's universal for human beings. And he hurt to his heart. Then he who is said, I will wipe away the man, that is the race of mankind, whom I have created from upon the surface of the ground, from mankind to animal to creeping thing to bird of the sky, because I am grieved that I have made them. There it is. Mankind, the animal world, on the land, above the land, in the air, they're all out of control. And they all need to be taken out because of the curse, the, the effect of the curse on all of them. That's what it's all because of. So God's going to prepare here for, for a new world, if you will, if you, if you don't mind a... Um, a term often used of American history. Uh, he's going to create a new world and it will be different than this one was. That's the point. He's going to, he's going to lessen the impact of the evil of mankind. And of course, he goes on to say that mankind's days will be what? How many? 120 years. That's a pronouncement of the eventual lifetime, maximum lifetime that mankind will be able to have. And sure enough, by around 1400 BC, that's exactly what happens. It, it slowly declines all the way down to Moses' day. And there's one or two people after Moses who live 120 years, but nobody beyond that. That's when it kicks in fully, the, the implications of that promise, of that, uh, that restriction, that judgment. All right, so um, the meaning of Ha'adam in Genesis 6.1. What does the man mean? And can you trust me that this means mankind as a whole? So let's look at it. So the article ha, in, in, in English that's the, plus the noun, and that's Adam in Hebrew. We know it as man or mankind. The man um, the article plus the noun is used consistently in the first two chapters of Genesis to refer to the first man who was formed. In other words, when, when Moses used the article the and the Hebrew word Adam, man, together, he was talking about Adam, the first man. In those first two chapters, consistently. Most often, Bibles translate it, the man. In 2.20, the New American Standard Update first translates Adam as Adam. Now we're giving him a name. And this is our old friend, the transliteration idea again, right? Taking the Hebrew word and just sounding it out in English rather than giving its meaning. But, um, so that's that. Um, so 2.20. What does that verse say? The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So we have one use at the beginning here, the man, that we call articular. It means when the article's connected to the noun. Um, 
And that clearly is a reference to that one man, Adam, even though the article's with it, okay? Um, and then there's no article there where I have it in red, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So Moses drops the use of the article and just gives the, um, uh, the word mankind, for, for lack of better terms, and, um, and he uses it in reference to Adam. So this is the first introduction we get to, um, to this construction, at least in English, where, where Adam is called by name. Um, in Genesis 3.17, Moses makes another specific reference to this first man without the definite article, essentially the equivalent of using Adam as a name. From these points forward in the New American Standard Update Translation, every time Adam is named in Genesis, there is no definite article. So, Genesis 3.17, Then to Adam, Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, etc., etc. So, um, there you have it. In 3.17, another reference to the first man, Adam, without the definite article, just like we saw in 2.20 the second half of that verse. Um, the other three references to Adam in the Hebrew Bible also are anarthrous. In other words, no article with it. So the idea is that Moses um, makes that shift to speaking of Adam without the article the. Now we just call him by name. And then that's followed by other biblical writers, both in Chronicles, in um, whoever the writer of Job is, and then Hosea. Therefore, from Genesis 2.20b forward in the Hebrew Bible, any time Adam is mentioned, his name does not include the definite article. The final time that Ha'adam is used in Genesis of the first man seems to be in 3.24, where God drove out the man, that is, Adam the individual. So the article is used there with Adam, the Adam, if you will, and it's speaking about just the one man. It's not as though God was driving out hundreds of people. By the time that Moses reaches Genesis 6.1, Ha'adam refers to the race of mankind whose progenitor was Adam. Here the text states that Ha'adam, that is with the article, began to increase on the surface of the earth. Certainly the author wasn't stating that Adam began to increase on the surface of the earth because the very next verse, uh, verse 2, notes that the sons of God saw the, da the daughters of Ha'adam. Since the earth already at this time was populated with Cain and Seth and all of their offspring, such as Seth's son Enosh in 426, the reference to Ha'adam here must refer to the entire Adamic race. So with this reference, we now have um, a strict use of the article, the, plus the word Adam, to refer to mankind in general, all those who derive from Adam, okay? So hopefully, you're, you know, you're set on that. If you're not set on that, then you can be open to that second view that I'm trying to let you know is just not a good view. So understanding this will help you. It, it will kind of, you know, can I use the term? It will be a vaccination to keep you away from the virus. All right. Um, so, again, now it came to pass that the man, and so here's where I'm suggesting from what I just showed you, that survey, we can insert with confidence that he's talking about mankind, all of humanity that derived from Adam. Males and females, young and old, everyone who came from Adam falls under that umbrella. Okay? So, now we move on. Who then are the sons of God in Genesis 6? Good question. Well, first of all, I have to tell you something that with looking at the uses of this phrase in the Hebrew Bible, it, I think it gives us confidence to assert that this is what we call a technical term. It's a technical term. It's not just a generic word. It's a technical term that when together as a unit 
is meant to be understood as a specific unit. All right? So let's see if we can come up with this. There it is, verse 2. Then the sons of God, the Bnei Ha Elohim, saw or looked at the daughters of mankind, that they were beautiful. So what did they do? They took women, right? They didn't marry women. They took women for themselves from all whom they had chosen. Uh, they could have, let's, let's bring this up to speed. They could have benefited by a Me Too movement before the flood. It really would have helped, but they just didn't have the technology. I don't know. They didn't get to do that. So who are these sons of God? And again, in our parenthetical statement, it appears again, the fallen ones were on the earth in those days and afterwards also when the sons of God were going into the daughters of the man. So again, there the sons of God is equated with um, the fallen ones. All right. Um, so let's figure this out. Who are these sons of God? Well, there's, there are only five uses of this technical term in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, four of them have the article with it. One omits the article, but I think there's still a clear usage of that technical term, even without the article. Genesis 6.2, which is part of our passage. Genesis 6.4, which is part of our passage. So that makes it a little bit more challenging, right? We've just lost two out of five. That's 40%. Um, to help, you know, of opportunities elsewhere to see it, that it could help us here. But we do see it with clarity in Job 1.6, where it says, Now there was a day when the Bnei Ha Elohim, the sons of God, came to present themselves in the presence of He who is. And Satan also came into their midst. And the whole context of this is Satan was seeking to find a way to turn um, Job against God, and he started it, he initiated it all, going right to God's throne and saying, hey, you know, what about this guy? And the whole plan is for God to help him find a way to turn God and Job against each other, um, which in the end fails, of course, as it should. But in this passage, Satan is where? Is he on Jupiter? Where is he? Yeah, he's in the abode of God. Where God dwells, that's where he was, presenting these ideas to God, starting this dialogue. And whoever these B'nai Ha Elohim, these sons of God, whoever they are, they are with him there in the presence of God. Question, do you know anybody who's derived from Adam who can freely come and go from the presence of God? Do you know anybody like that? Raise your hand if you do. Nobody? No takers? I'm with you. There isn't a human being that can go there. So doesn't that tell us a lot about who the sons of God are? They have to have the ability to come and go from the presence of God, just like Satan. There you go. And we see it again in Job 2.1, same thing. There was another day when the B'nai Ha Elohim him, came to resent themselves in the presence of he who is, and Satan also came in order to present himself in the presence of he who is. And this is when Satan was um, um, plaguing Job with boils from head to toe. right? All part of the master plan, to turn them against each other. So, same deal, same B'nai ha, ha Elohim, in the presence of God, two times. So it's clear who these B'nai ha Elohim, these sons of God, are. And then the final reference in Job 38 uh, beginning of verse 4 and then verses 6 and 7 says this. Where, and this is God speaking rhetorically, right? As if, you know, he needed to, but he, he wanted to kind of put things in perspective about this idea of questioning God. So he says, where were you during my founding of the earth? To what were its bases sunk? Right? How, how do you connect like Legos, how do you connect it that, that it even starts? Were you there? Did you, did you see it? Did you participate? Do you know how it was done? Could you do it yourself? 
Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars, right, that's the first entity, were shouting out in joy. Somebody was watching. It's like a crowd watching a great sporting event, right? They were jumping up and down cheering. Whoa, this is really cool. And all of the B'nai Ha Elohim, I'm sorry, there's no Ha. And all of the B'nai Elohim, sons of God, yelled out loudly, right? So this is what we call Hendiatus. It's repeating twice using different terms, the same thing, okay? So whoever the morning stars are, they're also the sons of God, right? The morning stars are the sons of God. So my note, not only are morning stars a clear reference to angelic beings, and that's almost, if not universally, accepted, but this use of Hendiatus also includes the sons of God who rejoiced at the creation of the earth which took place on day one of creation. So question number two, do you know anybody derived from Adam who was there to watch and applaud at day one of creation? Anybody? No takers? Strike two, right? So we're, we're finding it impossible to connect sons of God with anyone who came from the line of Adam. So, folks, what does that do to the godly line of Seth view? Deep six. It's under, way underground and needs to stay buried. Not a pet cemetery kind of thing. All right. Since Adam and thus the race of mankind was not created until day six of creation, the B'nai Ha Elohim must have been alive as functional beings at least five days before the advent of mankind, before mankind came to life. So again, can't be anyone related to Adam. For this reason, the B'nai Ha Elohim of 6-2 can be spirit beings who were around on day one of creation to rejoice at the splendor of earth's formation. Yet by the time of Job, they were accomplices of Satan, whose scheme was to turn Job against God, first by stripping away his possessions and killing his children, and second by striking him with painful boils from top to bottom. So any attempt to connect these B'nai Ha Elohim in Genesis to some alleged godly line of Seth, a modern term rather than a biblical term, simply cannot be sustained by the context of Genesis 6. After a study of the text of Genesis 6, 1 through 7, uh, in, um, the, the evil angelic view will be proven to be superior to the line of Seth view. So, next question. Who are the fallen ones? And I already kind of hedged my bet or whatever the term is. I kind of gave it away a little bit. Um, I, and I told you that the fallen ones... Uh, that, that, that the Nephilim literally are the fallen ones, and I told you that it's the other side of the coin for the B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. So, who are the fallen ones? And the other question, from what did they fall? Good question. So there it is in the text. It doesn't show up until our parenthetical in verse 4, where it says, the fallen ones were on the earth in those days and afterwards also when the sons of God we're going into the daughters of the man. So it's talking about, I'm convinced, one group of people. Um, they, were all, they were on the earth in those days when um, in the very beginning, right? In the very beginning, which we already saw with the sons of God, they were there wa watching and clapping when day one of creation happens and probably every other day of creation. So they were there. And afterwards also, when the sons of God were going into the daughters of the man. So it's, it's, it's kind of like speaking from both sides of the mouth, but it's, it, it's still only referring to one group. So, the, so the, the sons of God, the fallen ones, were there from the beginning, and they were there when some of them went into the daughters of mankind and created offspring by implication, okay? So, um, now, again, some people want to connect this, and some translations want to connect 
the fallen ones, to giants. Um, the, the Hebrew word nephilim was translated by the um, Jewish scholars who knew both Hebrew and Greek. They translated it with the, he, with the Greek word gigantes, right? So they translated it gigantes, which are giant ones. Which, remember, um, the events that happened firsthand were before, you know, they were 3300 B.C. or before, right? And Moses writes when? Much later, in, by 1406 B.C. Long time, almost two millennia later. And then the translation of the Septuagint is about... 1,200 years or 1,100 or 1,200 years after Moses, the Hebrew scribes are translating into Greek. So we're talking, folks, about being way removed from the actual events of the time. And these translators, by this time, it's kind of like one of those stories where, you know, Grandpa caught a, this massive fish one day and, you know, this or, he did this or that with it, won a contest or whatever. And as it grows, you know, it was, it was this big in Grandpa's day, and in Dad's day it was this big, and in my day it's this big, right? The story just keeps growing. That's the idea. So the translators of the Hebrew Bible, by the way, were not under inspiration, the inspiration of God, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when they penned this, okay? So they were free to make mistakes, and I'm convinced they made a mistake here. Because the Greek word gigantes was transliterated directly into Latin. We see it in the Vulgate with gigantes. And that word was translated by the King James translators directly into giants. There you have it. There are your giants. But I've got a problem for you. If you want to go back to the beginning, it, that's the Hebrew word. It doesn't mean giants does not. It means those who fell. That's all it means. Those who fell. So, uh, the Hebrew word nephilim is a masculine plural participle that derives from the verb nephal. The undisputed meaning of this third person masculine singular verb, it's a cal, if you want the stem, a Hebrew stem, is he fell. And it is used of how Cain's countenance fell when God disregarded his offering, as well as of how the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights during the flood of Noah's day. That's right after our passage, all that happens. So, what is falling? It's going from up to down. Simple as that, right? That's what this means. Those who were up and went down. Luke 10, 17. Let's throw in some really useful information for our purposes. Uh, as recorded in Luke 10, Jesus had sent out 70 of his disciples to perform great deeds and to announce that the kingdom of God had come near to them. After the 70 disciples returned to Jesus, they told him of their astonishment that demonic beings were subject to them in the name of Jesus. His reply to them appears in Luke 10, 18. Then he said, he, Jesus, said to them, to, to these disciples, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. Bingo. Jesus saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. Implication, Jesus was around from before the lifetime, the birth of, the coming into existence of Adam. He was predating that. He watched Satan fall. While it's disputed as to whether Isaiah 14 records the event of the fall of evil angels from the heavenly abode of God at their initial disobedience, there's no dispute about the Greek Bible's record of this event for Satan. Here, Jesus himself states clearly that he obviously, in his pre-incarnate state as the second member of the Trinity, observed Satan fall from his original place in heaven in the abode of God. If Satan fell from that abode, his evil angels also must have fallen from there, thus 
they truly can be the fallen ones of Genesis 6-4. True? Okay, Satan fell. It's the Greek version of that same Hebrew word. And obviously, his a certain number of the angels fell with him. So it works. It fits. Jesus saw Satan fall. He also must have seen, he doesn't say it, he also must have seen the angels who were, you know, previously gods and glorious and, and, and righteous. He saw them turn as well. So they had to fall with him. It's pretty simple. Not rocket science. Who are the powerful ones in Genesis 6? And this is in blue here in my text. We're still in that parenthetical statement, right, with those parentheses. Um, extra information that Moses is adding. They, the sons of God, that is equal to the fallen ones, were the powerful ones. So now we have a third term for them, which reinforces uh, and gives greater uh, credence to the suggestion I'm making to you that the sons of God and the fallen ones are one and the same. They were the so now we have a three-sided coin. Isn't this cool? I've never seen a three-sided coin before. Here's one. They were the powerful ones, not the mighty men, but the powerful ones who were from antiquity, males of renown. The problem with translating Gibor as a mighty one here is that in English... This usually implies someone mighty in a good sense, such as David's mighty men, or Apollos in the New Testament, who was mighty in the Scripture. Nimrod was anything but mighty in a positive sense. That's Genesis 10. In fact, he is one and the same with Sargon of Akkad, the first empire builder. He, and he was clearly anything but good. In fact, Sargon of Akkad was a ruthless killer who invaded cities and killed armies, if not their civilian occupants as well. And then he incorporated their cities and possessions into his growing empire. So he was the opposite of a mighty one doing good things. So I don't like the term mighty ones here, not because it's impossible to use it. You can say that but because of the association we often have with the term mighty men. It's usually a good connotation. I'd rather pick a term that's a negative connotation because Nimrod is an example of someone who's very negative. Here's the, here's the verse. Now Cush sired Nimrod. That one acted irreverently in order to become powerful on the earth. He became a powerful slaughterer in the sight of he who is. That's the... I think a more faithful translation. He became a powerful slaughterer in, in the presence of, before the eyes of, he who is. That's the idea. Okay? So, that's why I like that term a little bit better. Um, so, who were the powerful ones? They were the fallen ones. They were the sons of God. They were um, alive before creation started. They... Um, uh, they were there watching um, God put things together. They are also the powerful ones who were from antiquity, males of renown. So if my suggestion to you, and again, I'm not alone in this, but is correct that these are evil angelic beings, then Moses couldn't use a term that would connect them to the line of mankind. He had to choose a different term because they weren't from Adam's line. And that's why he chooses the word males. Just like an animal can be a male, but not a person, not a human, not a man. Okay. Um, reasons why the sons of God must be evil angels. I'm going to skip this because of time, but it's good stuff. Um, and finish with this. And we're not going to have time. I think it's too late to do the, uh, the archaeological connection that I think can be made. But this, let's make time for this. There is fuller revelation about these evil angelic beings as Scripture goes along. So we don't have to just rely on kind of an ugly interpretation of Genesis 6 and hope it's right. It fits. Let's see how it fits. 1 Peter 3, 17-22. 
Um, Peter says, for it's better to go on suffering, etc. Verse 18, because Christ indeed died once concerning sins, etc. On one hand, being put to death in the flesh, but on the other hand, brought to life in spirit. So Peter's drawing, he's focusing on Jesus, telling us some, some things that we need to know about Jesus. And, and he's saying, on one hand, he did this in the realm of the flesh. And on another hand, he did this in the realm of the spirit. What did he do in the realm of the spirit? Well, verse 19, in which also, and that means in the spirit, okay? That is a relative pronoun going back to the term spirit. In which, in the spirit, in the realm of the spirit. In spirit, he also gave a proclamation, and that's from the verb keruso, which is not evangelizo. Evangelizo um, is the verb for preach the gospel, preach the good news. But this is to announce, like what a town crier used to do back in the day. He'd get up on a platform or whatever, or on a podium, on, on a balcony, and he would tell the whole town. You know, they'd collect a town, and he'd, he'd yell out for the whole town to hear an announcement. That's what this is, K. Russo. Jesus proclaimed. He announced something. It doesn't tell us what he announced, but he announced something. He gave this proclamation after going to the spirits in prison. Oh, so in spirit, Jesus went, not in flesh, but in spirit, Jesus departed. He went to this prison where spirits were and he gave this announcement. Wow, which spirits? Who were they? What spirit beings? Verse 20, after their disobedience in a previous time, before Jesus, when the long-suffering of God was in the state of waiting during the days of, here we go, Noah. Who were these evil angelic beings to whom Jesus proclaimed, announced something? They were the same wicked, evil angels who took on human flesh and went into the daughters of mankind. That's who they were. He made an announcement to them. Do you think, folks, he was preaching the gospel? No. You know, maybe you're open to purgatory. I'm not. Especially, even worse, for evil angelic beings who were never humans in the first place. While an ark was being prepared, right? And that's, that's our story. That's, that's from our context, isn't it? Genesis 6, 1 through 7. I'm not making this up for you. It's clear. Okay? Jesus made this announcement there. What did he announce? Let's come back to that. Therefore, the interpretation of evil angelic beings in Genesis 6 fits perfectly with the spirits to whom Jesus, while in spirit himself, right? After he died at Calvary, he could depart in spirit, couldn't he? That's what he did. Um, he, he made this proclamation. Where did Jesus announce this proclamation? To the evil spirit beings who committed heinous evil in Noah's day. Peter doesn't tell us, but can we know? Let's see. The answer, I think, is found in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Therefore, it says, and speaking of Jesus, having ascended on high, he led captivity captive. What I'm convinced that means is he led, he led free, he freed the, the godly spirit beings who were, who were previously unable to be permanently in the presence of God because there was not yet a completing of the process of the forgiving of sins, right? All Jesus' uh, all sacrifices could do until Jesus' sacrifice was to cover sin, not take it away. So the people who died couldn't go permanently into the presence of God. And that's why I'm convinced when Jesus is talking about this illustration, you know, um, the, the um, Abraham's bosom thing, and he's talking about a contrast between two groups, um, those who weren't suffering and those who were suffering, and the ones who weren't suffering couldn't get to the ones who, who the ones who were suffering couldn't get to the ones who weren't suffering. And I'm convinced that was real. Jesus wasn't faking it. He wasn't creating a story that wasn't based on reality. 
So if that's true, if I'm right, you know, could be right or wrong on this one, but I'm convinced that's the case, that, that um, he, he let loose those who had died who believed in God by faith and it was reckoned to them as righteousness. So, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to, to humans. Now the saying, he ascended, he went up. What is its meaning except that he also descended, where? Into the lower parts of the earth. Aha. So after Jesus died, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. In what capacity? In flesh? In spirit. So this passage connects logically and chronologically with Peter's passage that we just looked at. Jesus descends down into the center of the earth and there he finds these evil angelic beings who are around in Noah's day trying to do something terrible. And we haven't gotten to the point yet. We haven't answered that one. You know, what was their intention? Uh, and we'll get to that before we finish. All right. Um, so the location of the proclamation of Jesus to the evil angels of Noah's day, in my humble opinion, was the lower parts of the earth. No text states what he announced to them. But undoubtedly, his message was that their sinister plot to corrupt the purely human line that needed to go directly from Adam to Messiah, 100% clean, had failed miserably. Instead, Jesus was born within that pure line. And he lived a completely sinless life as the only begotten Son of the Father and conquered sin and eternal separation from God by becoming a sinless sacrifice while dying on the cross. What's more, he was resurrected, which according to 1 Corinthians 15, made him the first fruits among all who eventually will be resurrected. Thus, the place where Jesus announced the failed plot to these evil angels was the lower parts of the earth. And here's another contribution, Jude 6. It reads like this, And angels who did not maintain their domain. What is their domain, folks? The spirit realm, right? They didn't stay there, but abandoned their proper place of habitation. He, that is God, had guarded in perpetual, has guarded in perpetual bonds under darkness. Do you see how it fits now? It's a third puzzle piece from the New Testament. Where were they? Center of the earth. Is it light or dark there? You know, go down 10 miles, go down 20 miles. Light or dark? Dark. It's all dark. There it is. In darkness. In bondage, right? Right. Jesus went to them in prison, Peter said. It all fits together. These are who the evil angelic beings were. So, here we are at the end of the line. What's the point? What was their plan? What was this, this diabolical scheme they had in mind? It was to corrupt the pure human line that needed to go from Adam to Messiah so that Messiah could live and die sacrificially as a fully human man so that it could... And because of his infinite nature, it could be applied universally to all mankind who would believe in him and salvation would work eternally. Does that make sense? That was the plan. And Jesus announced what? <laughs> you lose. I win. And pray, you know Jesus, right? He probably didn't even say I win. He said the Father's plan wins. I just did what I was supposed to do. Right? He always gives the credit to the Father. So, all this to say, obviously I'm giving you a view, as I said in the beginning, I don't like the view. But it's true. That's all I can do. All I can do is call it as it is and trust that God had lots of reasons for it. I have questions that are unanswered. I do. I can't answer my own questions. You may have questions too. But someday, maybe I'll get to ask. Or, you know, it'll be on the bulletin boards on the new earth or something. Um, of course, I guess it'll probably be all electronic then, right? Um, but there it is. 
the sons of God, evil angelic beings who fell from their place with God, who became powerful ones on the earth in an attempt to corrupt that purely human line that had to go from Adam to Jesus. But it failed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege you give us to look into your word. Thank you for the joy of exploration, um, trying to sort through all the weeds and sort through all of the challenges and, um, and get to a place of understanding. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would protect everyone hearing my voice from error. If I have erred in any way, find a way, Lord, to bring them into clarity and into correctness because I don't want to, re, um, to lead your people astray uh, because I understand um, the awesome responsibility it is to feed your sheep with your truth. Um, so protect us, each one of us, from evil. Protect us from, um, from living our lives like it was lives were being lived in the days before Noah or during, before and during the days of Noah. Help us to seek after you so diligently that we find ourselves so busy doing righteous deeds that we don't have time to do evil. That's the key. That's the key to putting on the new man and casting aside the old man by doing everything in our power with all of our time to work at what makes you honored and brings glory to your son, Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you that he did make it to earth from a purely, within a purely human line. Thank you that you thwarted this plan of the evil one and his evil angelic beings. And thank you that one day you will judge them and your judgment will result in sending them into hell forever. Hell is an empty place right now, but it's going to be very full. And we thank you that they will be there these evil, wicked corruptors. Um, guide us and direct us that we would be your ambassadors. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.